Hi, everyone. It's an honor to be here at the Serverless Practitioners Summit 2020. I'm really excited to be here with you today. And today, I'm going to be talking about how we can use WebAssembly and OpenFast, two very popular open source projects, to create a universal runtime for serverless functions. My name is Ramiro Berrellesa. I'm one of the co-founders of Octero. At Octero, we build dev tools that make uh, the lives of cloud native developers a lot easier. Before Octero, I used to be an architect at Atlassian and a software engineer at Azure, so a lot of time running services and on the cloud. And if you want to connect after the, the talk, you can find me as at rberlesa in most places, Twitter, Stack Overflow, Dev2, the likes. So today, we're going to talk about what is WebAssembly, what's the role of WebAssembly on serverless. I'm going to give you a demo of the things I've been experimenting with. And then we'll talk about where can we start, how can we collaborate, and how can we make everything cooler and better. So let's start with WebAssembly. What is it? Well, at a very high level, WebAssembly is a low-level assembly-like language with a compact binary format that runs near-native performance and provides languages with a compilation target so that they can run on the web. This is a project that was started at Mozilla a few years ago, and they were trying to build something that improved the experience of dev develop web developers over the existing you know, JavaScript and, and similar languages. Uh, they saw this as something similar to how assembly languages work on a computer, where you're going to write your code on any language. Rust seems to be the most popular, but they have, you know, you can run Rust, Go, JavaScript itself, and then compile to this assembly that was meant to run on the browser. It was really focused on making it small, secure, easy to use, you know, all these things that are important for web. What's funny is that a lot of you in the community start seeing this as things that were very beneficial, not only for the web, but also for more traditional applications. And a couple of years ago, WebAssembly made a huge jump out of the browser and into servers and everyone else. And why? Well, WebAssembly is fast. Instead of having a full-on OS package in a container for your application, you can have the assembly and the, the WebAssembly runtime that runs on your server, on your IoT device, takes care of a lot of this uh, requirement that had before. WebAssembly is portable because you can write it on any, pretty much any programming language and then run it anywhere there's a WebAssembly runtime available, which makes it super convenient when you need to distribute applications all over the place. And WebAssembly is secure. The WebAssembly sandbox is, the is designed to make things secure based on a very interesting capability model where you ask for permission before you do any task and, in general, makes the, the lives of developers easier, especially when you need to run your application on untrusted locations. And all of these things, which initially made sense for the web, they really make sense when you think of any other type of application that we're building. Who doesn't want their application to be fast, to be secure, to be portable? And this is something that's especially interesting for the serverless world, where these concerns are even more important. The fact that WebAssembly is fast is very important on a serverless world because of the well-known call start problem. We want to be able to run functions quickly. We don't want to wait for you know, a container with three, 400 megs or even 50 megs to be loaded and started. So WebAssembly gives us super tiny assemblies that make this a lot faster. Being portable helps us because now anyone can write functions. You don't have to be an expert on lambdas, on Knative. Any language that has a target on WebAssembly, which at this point are pretty much all of the major ones, can join and help us build functions, which is something that for me is really cool. It started with Rust, but if you're a Java dev, Node, Go, it also works. And it's secure. This is something that for us working with functions matters a lot because we're moving from, especially if we move, from this highly controlled environment like Lambda towards more multi-tenant settings like Kubernetes, like running on edge devices, on, on Raspberry Pi. So we want to make sure that our functions are going to perform as we expect and without any extra requirements, permissions, or things that could go wrong. And there's been a lot of interest on, on WebAssembly as a core part of, of the serverless experience. The past two years, uh, companies, especially Cloudflare and Fastly, have been very vocal about how they see the future of serverless uh, and the future of WebAssembly kind of like joining. Uh, 
Cloudflare, a couple of years ago, came out with um, Cloudflare Workers, which in one of their variations uses WebAssembly to run, um, to run their workloads on Cloudflare's workers on Edge. Another one, Fastly, the same thing. They're investing a lot in this WebAssembly ecosystem because they do acknowledge that there's a lot of value in being able to run these things fast, small, compliant, all of these things. And all of these uh, blog posts, articles are super interesting. I'm going to link them at the end of this presentation in case you want to read them later. I do recommend you do. Here's another one um, by someone that associated with Fastly. I don't know if he works, if Robert works there. But it's very interesting on how he's building this bioinformatics, biotech sort of functions, and how WebAssembly is not only more efficient than, than JavaScript, it's faster, but also smaller and easier to distribute. So all of these things are pretty cool. Now, if you see, there's a theme here, and it's kind of what brought me to, to talk with everyone here today, is that all of these things are closed environments. Cloudflare is great, Fastly is great, but it only works if you're in their ecosystem. And you know, for us, for me, it's very important to be able to you know, leverage an open community, open source. So that's what kind of caught me thinking. Soon that we have a lot of technology around, right? We have Kubernetes, we have serverless frameworks, we have the, the, the WebAssembly community. How about we build the same experience, but on top of what we already have? It's a topic I've been discussing with friends for a while. And Alex Ellis, the uh, creator, founder of OpenFast, a few months ago, pointed me to this project. He told me, hey, you've been talking about WebAssembly for a while. Have you looked at this? Crosslet is a super interesting open source project started by the WebAssembly Kubernetes team at Microsoft, a lot of the uh, days guys, with the idea of creating a Qflet where you can run WebAssembly workloads on Kubernetes. And for me, this was like a fantastic deal. It was like, wow, if you have a node that you can run assemblies on Kubernetes, how about we put that with the existing you know, serverless frameworks and you know, just merge them and run WebAssembly functions on any Kubernetes um, cluster? So that was my idea. And you know, uh, I'm, I'm quite involved with the OpenFast community. We're giving talks. We, we know each other. They're like super interesting people, very committed community. We were talking about this, and, and we all came to the conclusion that, well, it should be possible because in one side you have Crosslet, which is using you know Kubernetes APIs, you know, it's using all these primitives to allow you to run web assemblies. And on the other side, you have OpenFast, which is open source, which is focused on giving you a platform for functions who also talks in this Kubernetes primitives. So what if we took OpenFast and Crosslet and use them together to create this experience for everyone? So this was kind of the idea that made me kind of start playing around with technologies. That's why I submitted this talk. And now I'm going to show you some of the uh, work that I've been doing on this. And spoiler alert, it, it is possible and it does work. So I'm going to show you a, a quick demo of, of the work that I'm doing. I'll talk a bit of like why we're doing this way, the restrictions and limitations we found. And hopefully by the end, you'll be so excited that you want to come join us and, and make this uh, even better. So I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to walk you through my setup. I did some of the setup before, just to make things a little bit more um, quicker and, and less kind of confusing during the demo. But everything I'm showing here today, I'm going to write a blog post. It's already on a GitHub repo. And you're going to be able to take a look, especially if you want to follow the code and all of those things. So the first thing I did is I started uh, Kind on my local machine. Kind, for those of you who are not familiar, is a distribution of Kubernetes that runs on Docker. I like it a lot for experimental work because it's very easy to build a cluster, tear it down, and there's no side effects. But everything I'm showing you today works on any Kubernetes distribution. It works on you know if you have a managed Kubernetes, bare metal. You might need to do a bit more work if you need to run the, the crosslet on, on bare metal, but I've I've seen docs that it works. So I'm here. So the second thing I did is I installed um, OpenFast. I'm using this really cool CLI called Arcade that I highly recommend. It's, it's the easiest way to install any cloud native application. All you have to do is do Arcade install OpenFast, and it will install OpenFast locally with all the dependencies or the configurations you need. I already did this beforehand. So if you look at this, I have my OpenFast cluster. It's up and running. 
So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set a port forward to the open fast gateway. One of the early restrictions I found with Crosslet is that the, cross, the code running on Crosslet must listen to port 8080. It's a temporary restriction, but for now, uh, my gateway is going to be running on port 8000 to avoid this crash. It's something that I talked to the, to the team over at Slack, and they're going to be fixing for version 0.5.0, so it should come out in a couple of months. But don't hold them to them. It's still it's still early on. All right, so we are running the gateway. So if you go to your browser at this point, you know I have here the OpenFast portal. If you haven't used OpenFast, is a really cool, very easy to use uh, framework for running functions on Kubernetes. It also works on other things. Uh, the community is building another distribution that runs only on on FastD, which is really cool. But today I'm focusing on Kubernetes one because that's the world I like to live on. So normally you will go here. Deploy your function. You can pick from a template that they already built in. You can build your own, all those things. Today, we're not going to be using a template. We're going to be using a function I created that uses WebAssembly. So the second thing I did is I got Crosslet running on my machine. Uh, if you go to the Crosslet repo on GitHub, you see they have very easy to follow instructions on how to bootstrap uh, your Crosslet and add it to any node. You could even add this to a cluster that's running remotely, like you could have a cluster on Google, on AWS, on Azure, and join your Crosslet locally. That requires you to set up. You can use the Inlet, which is another project to connect uh, your local development with a remote uh, cluster. Really cool thing. But today, I'm running everything locally to make it simple. So I'm going to close this for a second. If you go here and you see get nodes, you see that now my cluster has two nodes. It has kind, the, the Kubernetes master, and the tradition where the traditional container workloads will run. And I have Crosslet, which is the one, the one node where all my WebAssembly workloads are going to be running on. OK? So now, one of the really cool things about OpenFast is that they don't care about Kubernetes. You define a function based on this manifest where you tell you know, the, the CLI which gateway to use, which image your function was saved as, and then you can add certain things. In order for you to work with Crosslet, Crosslet requires all your workloads to have a specific annotation. This is so that Crosslet no Kubernetes knows to put the WebAssembly workloads on the Crosslet node and your traditional container-based workloads on your other nodes. Initially, OpenFast, because it's an abstraction and you only care about functions, they don't have a way to specify this at the Kubernetes level. However, on the last release of, of OpenFast, they added this really cool feature called Profiles, which allows you to create a profile to add things, extra things to your function. So with this, I'm going to tell OpenFast, deploy this Hello World function, use this image, and I'll get to that in a second, and apply this profile. And the profile looks like this. In this case, my profile is telling OpenFast to add certain tolerations to my function so that it gets scheduled on the right um, node. So I'm going to copy this, apply this. And I already created it before, but you create the, the profile as any other Kubernetes resource. So at this point, we're ready to go. So now going back to the function. For this example, I'm using um, this sample that the Crosslet team already created. It's a hello world kind of thing. It's a, it's a service that uses on port 8080 and responds with hello world. So it integrates really well with OpenFast. The code is there if you want to see it. Uh, it the code is written in Rust. Very simple. Takes a request, responds hello world, and then it gets compiled to a web assembly. What's really cool is that there's another tool, WASM to OCI, to take these assemblies and push them to any OCI compliant um, registry. So pretty much you can push your web assembly to a Docker, to a Docker repository. Docker Hub doesn't work, but at least some exper experiments, Azure and the Google Cloud registry work really well for this. And you can push your registry, your assembly there, and then your node is using the same mechanics that any other node to pull containers, but this one is pulling uh, WebAssembly. This is one of the really co cool things that surprised me that I really like about how we were using all this abstraction of this technology for new ways, which means we have to learn less and we can accomplish a lot more. That for me is like super cool. All right, so I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to be using the, the fast CLI, um, CLI for this. This is the CLI that you use to create, uh, invoke, uh, delete uh, functions. In this case, we're going to be using the, up, the deploy function. 
Typically, you'll use the opt function, which is the one that builds your image and deploys it. But because we're, I'm building a WebAssembly-based function, uh, the CDI does not support this yet. It only supports containers. But this is one of the things that, if there's interested, it's a really cool thing we could implement uh, together with the OpenFast community. All right, so I'm going to deploy this. And now I deploy this. And my function will be up and running in a few seconds. If we look at this from a pod Kubernetes perspective, you'll see that I have this configured to deploy my functions on the openfast-fn. And you see that it's running there. It's already there. If we kind of go deeper and see the YAML, there's a couple of things you'll notice. One is my profile was applied. So this particular pod has a specific toleration that the crosset expects, the WASM32 WASCC. And if you look at the node name, you look like it was placed on the crosslet, which means that it's running on a WebAssembly. It's pulling it from there, so it, it will work. And just to finish, kind of like this, this quick demo, now let's call our function. So I'm going to be using the fast CLI invoke. The function is called hello world. Hi. And you see that it answered. It answered with hello world. And this is my function on assembly. If we go back to the code, you'll see that this matches that. So you'll notice how we're still using all the existing tooling when it comes to Kubernetes serverless, but now we're doing things on a WebAssembly kind of world. And if you look deeper, you'll see that, for instance, the WebAssembly is about 10 to 15 times smaller than the equivalent Docker container. So just by virtue of the size of the artifact, we're going to be a lot faster to deploy, to scale up, to scale down. And because we can use all of this Kubernetes integration APIs, we can leverage an open fast's uh, ability to deploy these functions, to scale them, to scale them down to zero when there's no traffic, to do a call start, all these really cool things that we need when building serverless. And with the added benefit that if you kind of go back to here, there's no Kubernetes involved. Once you create the profile and someone can do that for you, everybody else that can still write functions, just you know, write your code like this. You don't have to handle, you don't have to worry about HTTP handling like listeners, all that. All that is taken care of by Crosslet and OpenFast. And you just focus on writing code, providing value, and building really cool things. So kind of to iterate on how this works. Um, it's a small diagram of how things work. When I'm running uh, the CLI, I'm talking to the OpenFast gateway. The gateway will use FastNetis, which is the, the Kubernetes provider for OpenFast. It will apply my OpenFast profile, and then it will deploy this into Kubernetes. The Kubernetes master, because of these tolerations and extra annotations, will place this on the crosslet. And then crosslet will pull this assembly from the container, from the container registry. In this example, we're using Azure. Azure's container registry, but it could be any other OCI compliant. And it starts the function. And everything else, because it's running on Kubernetes, will work as we expect it to work. We can use you know, services, forwards, all these other things. Not everything is implemented today. We did have to take some shortcuts. Uh, but this is something that the team, all these different teams can be are working on, especially the cross team, is really focused on giving you a fully compliant kubelet for all of these things. So it's something I'm really excited about. And just to kind of wrap it up, some of the conclusions I, I saw with this is that WebAssembly in the serverless world is in its infancy. WebAssembly itself is fairly new, but there's a lot of promise. Uh, it seems that uh, a lot of the things that they wanted to fix for you know, the web-based experience, they really make sense for our serverless world as well. You know, speeding up deployment, making sure that code can run anywhere, uh, making sure that you can write code locally with, you know, with one target in mind, uh, which is WebAssembly, and you don't have to worry about where it's going to be running. It's going to be running on you know, an ideal world, it, on, on Edge, on an IoT device, on a browser, on you know, a Kubernetes instance, on a fast food restaurant. It, sh it doesn't matter, because WebAssembly gives us all those runtimes, so we can write code, the same environment, test it, make sure it's going to work, and then you know, be more efficient at it. And based on what I'm seeing, I, I do think that WebAssembly is an ideal container for functions. I think it really helps drive this vision that serverless is pushing of you care about the value and you write the function. You don't have to worry about the OS. You don't have to worry about you know, which language you have to code on. You don't have to worry about opening sockets to handle requests. That's all taken care of. From a WebAssembly perspective, you have this very thin, very specialized binary with just your code. And that's great. 
And what I'm super excited is that we have the building blocks to make this a reality. You saw this demo. It is kind of raw, a lot of duct tape. But you can see that the, the promise is there. And Kubernetes is everywhere. And this is something that really helps us create platforms that can run on anything. It started, as you know, for big data centers. But now we have Kubernetes on ARM, small distributions like K3S, uh, big ones like the managed services. It really can run anywhere. And the work that the Crosslet team is doing it's letting us run WebAssembly workloads on any Kubernetes cluster. Today, I showed you a function, but it also works in pods, stateful sets, deployments. It should work on anything. It should not make a difference. Uh, one cool discovery is that OCI registries, you know, the Docker registry and similar, they really let you distribute your WebAssembly containers anywhere. You know, they already do that with Helm charts. Now we can also do it with WebAssembly, which is, again, reusing a lot of the things we already know how to use to build new things. And open fast is the perfect framework that lets you build, publish, deploy, and scale up and down all your WebAssembly functions. So we don't have to reinvent that. We just bring this new thing, WebAssembly, pair it with OpenFast and all the goodness that it brings into. And we can build something that can become the universal runtime for serverless functions. It runs everywhere, it's open source, and it fits back into these two great communities, which are the serverless community and three, the WebAssembly one and the Kubernetes community. So it wasn't everything easy. Now, there's some challenges and some things that need to be implemented. Crosslets, network capabilities are still a work in progress. Uh, a couple more versions, they should be in a much better shape. Docker Hub doesn't support pushing non-containers to the registry. So you have to use some alternatives. Uh, in my experience, um, Azure Container Registry and Google's Cloud Container Registry work really well. Uh, the runtime, WASCC, uh, it's kind of hard to work with today. There's still tools, demos, docs, and tutorials really needed for in order for this to to be easier. But if you know if, if you join the Slacks or join the communities, people are super friendly and looking forward to one, teach more people, and two, make it a lot easier for anyone. So if this is something that you're interested in, you find it you find it cool and want to collaborate, uh, there are some links there. Uh, the third one is where I'm gonna put all the source code and scripts I use for this demo. And please uh, reach out to me on Twitter. I would love to go about these things. Whether if you hate it, if you don't see any value, if you love it, if you want to be part of it, I would like to have a conversation on this. That's why I'm here today, to show you what I'm working on, why I think it's important, and hopefully some more think, think it is. And here are also some links on some of the blog posts and existing prior art that made me want to work on this. Uh, you might find them as inspiration or kind of just to kind of understand where uh, WebAssembly, serverless, Kubernetes, where everything is at these days. And with that, I want to thank you for your time. I hope that this talk is useful, that it was entertaining. And I'm going to be around for Q&A. If you have any more questions or topics you want to discuss, thank you. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Hi, everyone. Uh, Ramiro here. I hope that you enjoyed the conference. Thank you for coming. And now we're going to go over the Q&A segment. There are already some questions uh, on there that I'll, I'll get right on to them. If you have more questions, please type them. And if not, uh, that is uh, hashtag three dash serverless P R I C sum. Uh, Written in Java, Python, Node.js, Node.js, and Go. Yes, it is. Mozilla, so that's why a lot of the samples in WebAssembly. So I would. Muted.
And another question by by Edward by Edward Cacho. It says, "What are the common business business use cases for for WebAssembly?" So that the main use case with the way it got started is to help you have a smaller, tighter code for the web. Now it's is growing up from there to other other worlds, and like in this case, serverless or, or just kind of like your typical API workloads. Uh, the main use case that I've seen is the security, uh, especially the WAS CC actor model. Uh, it's a lot more secure. It, it works on this capability model where you have to pre-declare what files you're going to be accessing, what API is going to be accessing, so it, it makes it more declarative. The other uh, use case is when you have to run on very small devices. Uh, the WebAssembly is, is like 10x, 20x smaller than other containers, so it's very uh, useful for for things like you know running on the IoT devices, on systems, on chips. That is today the main the main use case for WebAssembly, but now it's it's expanding to to the rest of the world, it's expanding to web, to Kubernetes, and all of these things. Hmm, it seems that like my audio is, is failing, but uh, well, I hope uh, if you don't have any more questions. As, as I said earlier, I'm going to be on the Slack channel if you want to ask uh, some more. I, I'll be there. I hope the the call was uh, the the talk was useful, and uh, the call the talk will be online available in a few minutes, so you can you can get it there. See the see the links and all the source code of this is available is available on GitHub if you want to try it out by yourself. So thank you very much. And it's good seeing you. And enjoy the rest of the conference.